if, if you get right down to serious thinking, uh, it's better to live a faithful life than it is a long life. Now that, you know, that, that I can say that easier than I can embrace it, but, but it's the truth. It is the truth uh, that if one is convinced that the neighbor claims that are grounded in the reality of God uh, are reliable, then to give one's life over to that uh, is uh, a joyous way to live. Mm. So how do, do I get to choose who my neighbor is? How do I know what, where my neighbor is? Is it the next door physical neighbor? <laughs> that, along with many others. <laughs> is the neighbor the, the wealthy sort of uh, Republican golf playing egomaniac mm. next door to me, my neighbor? Could be, could be. And that, and that neighbor probably uh, has many unacknowledged needs. So he could be a he could be a neighbor could be a neighbor of a gospel type. That's right. That's right. It's not just the poor. No, that's right. That's right. Wow. Yeah. 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 So this is literally be, because if if the main neighbor need is the the concrete performance of faithfulness, there's a fair chance that those kind of neighbors don't know much about concrete faithfulness. Someone continuing to show up for them, continuing to keep their promises, right. continuing to be so a friend. To listen to them. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't really get to choose who the neighbor is. It's just, well, we don't. Right. That's right. That's right. They just, uh, they come at us. Yeah. Or, or they're sent by God. <laughs> so how do you end up... Uh, if everyone's looking for the answer man and the guy that's you know how do you yeah. change that culture I mean I guess I guess my, my bigger question is about like the modern church like there's an exodus that's happening from Christianity itself oh it happened in my church it was like three years ago people just decide not to come to church anymore it's astonishing now they come every third week and they think it's regular <laughs> see I I think it's so simplistic but I think the 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 uh, pivot point is love of neighbor, and everything follows from that. You can test every policy. You can test every theological truth. You can test everything. Serious transformative speaking and listening uh, is slow, and it's face to face all the things that tell against technological management. So you really believe it has to be physiological? It well, I'm, I'm probably old-fashioned about that, but yeah, I, I think that's right. Mm. Yeah. And may, maybe maybe younger people know better than that. I don't, I don't know. But that's what I think. Emmanuel Levinas, who's this big Jewish philosopher, says it's all about seeing the neighbor's face. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. He said it is from your neighbor's face that you get your ethical mandates. We were we were talking about uh, Hosea two yesterday, and and uh, Hosea two was divorce. God's divorce from Israel and God's remarriage to Israel. And, and uh, then God, Hosea has God use five words, I will betroth you to me in justice, righteousness, compassion, steadfast love, and mercy, I think is the fifth one. Well, they're all roughly synonyms. So this is, this is, and then if you begin to trace those words elsewhere from that cluster, you begin to see it everywhere. So I have recently decided to translate uh, the word that we translate steadfast love, to translate it tenacious solidarity. 
And it means that God is in tenacious solidarity with Israel or uh, with the poor or with the church or whoever you think God's connected to or with the world. So, so tenacious solidarity does not mean that God has the power to, but it's like a mother. A mother has tenacious solidarity with her children. It doesn't mean she can protect them from everything. It doesn't mean she can give them every good gift in the world, but she is there at risk with them. And, and I think that's how God is basically portrayed. Uh, and, uh, but, but, but when the, when the Christian tradition got translated into Greek categories in the third and fourth centuries, we, we lost that Jewish accent on fidelity and we settled for Hellenistic categories of omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. That requires us to give up the notion that God is basically defined by power, that God is basically defined by fidelity, not power. My experience it is so hard for people who have inhaled that theology uh, to make a transition. And, and then w what derives from that then is that men, <laughs> men are more made in the image of God than women, Happy. start there. Then to be godlike means to be all powerful, all knowing, and all present. So that's what you get. And then, then that delivers into sexual predation and all that, it follows. So if you start by saying, uh, that's not who God is. God is an agent of tenacious solidarity who is willing to suffer with and suffer for. What does that mean for me to be made in the image of that God? Mm. So, so that's, the, that's the elemental work of conversion, I think, uh, that we mightily resist. Hmm? That was Jesus. It was Jesus. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So what's the Father like? The Father is like Jesus who practices tenacious solidarity with the poor, the sick, the prisoners. The prophets in the 8th and 7th and 6th centuries uh, BCE uh, they, they really use their poetry to cause a theological revolution in, in which uh, through the exile and all that, uh, God is vulnerable, God suffers with, and all of that. And what's for sure is that people haven't a clue about that in the Old Testament. So, so we won't run out of things to teach. <laughs>